Um, welcome back to the Bro Diallo uh, book review. I'm very proud uh, to have the book reviews back. Uh, you guys have shown me uh, that you're definitely interested in um, these book reviews, and I'm definitely very uh, grateful to have be in the position to bring you these reviews. Thank you for everyone uh, with um, who support the Brody Allo broadcast and the various uh, broadcasts. I got more things in the work, but I'm very, very happy, uh, even though better late than never, that the uh, the book reviews are back and we're going to maintain them here forward. Uh, if you want to go back and look at my previous book reviews, I did all three of the uh, the um, Dale Jones Culture Bandit series, volume one, two, and three. I, and then we did um, the Iceman's Inheritance and uh, Amos Wilson's book. And I was going to do the full uh, Black on Black Violence, but I was going to do the full Amos Wilson review. But I figure, you know, you pro guys probably want to chop it up a bit and hear from various authors, especially living authors. So this is a Bro Diallo book review first. This is the first text that we've reviewed of an actual um, author that's not in the ancestral realm. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to present that. So um, if there is time, I'm definitely going to reach out to the author, uh, Brother Creamer, and see if he can come on and do a um, Q&A with us uh, after we review the book, people get an opportunity to, to watch this video, and then we'll have him on and we can engage him directly. Because I do have some questions um, for him. And as the review proceeds, I'll tell you some things that I don't fully agree with him on, but I'm sure we, we'll get uh, further clarification on the on, on our couple of small, minute, nitpicky disagreements that I have with, with his work. But that's the nature of scholarship. Uh, Bernard, he is a scholar. He is an educator. Uh, he actually worked with my uh, wife, Dr. Mingo, and um, but I might go into that history. But let me just give you all I don't, might as well say it now before I forget, which he doesn't mention in the book, which kind of surprises me, is he taught for several years at a Southside high school. And I know that several of the, the rappers who make the type of content that he talks about in this book, drill rappers, some of the most prominent drill, drill rappers were actually students at this school that went on to have careers and be known across the globe. But he doesn't, I guess he doesn't want to brag. So I'm gonna just brag for the brother. He's not just a researcher, he's a hands-on. I mean, he taught on the South side of Chicago. He's actually uh, taught in an institution uh, and was there at a time where some current prominent drill rappers uh, came out of that school uh, and rotated from that school and the school uh, many of the students from that school lived in the area you probably heard of called Old Block, South Side, um, Kenwood type area. But I won't say too much because he didn't mention it in the book. So I don't maybe he didn't want to seem biased for or against or maybe or whatever. But I'm going to go ahead and, and tell on the brother that he he's definitely uh, has some skin in the game. He was an educator and worked directly with people who are. Uh, about that life or came out of that um, genre of music in that generation. But anyway, so that's it. Now we're going to get into the meat of this book because there's quite a bit here and I want to get through it. And and I don't want to miss any of the the, the points that, that mostly stand out that he makes. So my initial insights after reading this book through twice, I read it once and then I you know started taking notes. But then over time and I was having issues with setting up for the, the book review, I just sat down and read it again because it is that engrossing. And, you know, being a hip hop head myself and entering hip hop in a time when it was into its infancy and watching the, the, the expansion of conscious and revolutionary hip hop and watching the erosion of the, the, the conscious hip hop, the golden era hip hop, the progressive hip hop into uh, what was called gangster back then. And I don't even call hip hop today really gangster rap. It's more just minstrel music. It's a, it's a pure, bona fide minstrel show, you know, from everything from promoting drug addiction. But I don't want to be that old folky. And I even made a note in the book, like, I don't want to idealize the past and condemn the present or the future, because a lot of us old heads tend to do that, especially when it comes to the music we came up with and how it evolved when another generation gets a hold of it. But I did. I we no one can can deny even uh, contemporary hip hop heads, you know, acknowledge that hip hop was at one time a, a politically charged 
uh, art form that it it no longer is or it's no longer the mainstream or better yet to say when I was a child the political hip hop was considered mainstream hip hop and the gangster street uh, rap the antisocial um, hip hop or the reactionary hip hop was considered fringe or underground but that is totally flipped but anyway back to the book y'all didn't come here to hear from Brody Allo, uh in this presentation but my initial insights or my initial uh conclusions after reading the book if you know two major things that i take away from the book is the the move from conscious hip-hop or uplifting hip-hop to murder music of today was not the choice of the black community or black artist and uh the author of who stole the soul really made a point to drive that home i appreciate that so much i need to be reminded of that mu uh often i need to be reminded of that because having that conclusion that this music wasn't our choice wasn't something we 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 rallied for or or demanded from the industry uh gives me um optimism about our 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 chances our our at least our capacity to turn our culture around to reclaim our culture and begin to use our expression and our art in the interest of african people mainly towards african empowerment and african liberation that's the the number one insight the second insight that i get is ain't no such thing as just music music is born out of and feeds into the culture politics and economics of the community and society that produce it and consumes it this this music that you i don't care and anybody anybody let me not say i don't care but anyone who has been in the community advocating for um pro more progressive music or trying to critique or identify the dangers of the current reactionary hip-hop will will inevitably run into most people will say it's just music or i just like the beat you know and it's not just us who deal in this this music conflict but in movies oh it's just a movie it's just music it's just a pair of shoes but there are politics embedded in everything you wear, whether you're wearing Yeezys and Jordans or you're listening to Yeezy or, you know, you are watching the Yeezy documentary. There are politics and deep seated cultural implications of everything we do. So those are my two initial insights that I think that Bree Creamer thoroughly grasped and thoroughly, you know, articulates and he thoroughly um, instructs us on where we should stand based on those conclusions that the art, the so-called black art is not what black people ask for, even though we're the face of it, we're the drivers of it, we're the creators of it. And also it's always uh, bigger than hip hop to quote Dead Perez. It's much bigger than the music and there's no such thing as just music. Um, but there's a later quote, I don't wanna give too much away in the opening of it, but um, those are my two initial points. But as we go through the book and as you must buy this book and I will post uh, where you can secure the book, the website and everything. So that will be on the screen throughout the presentation. But, you know, you can share with me your initial or, or, or fundamental insights that you take away from from this uh, phenomenal text. So let's move forward. In the introduction, the first quote I want to uh, share with you from the text is uh, where Kramer states that the exploitation and manipulation of black music artists is longstanding, um, is a longstanding American historical reality. A lot of times in history, we tend to think what we're seeing today, we're the first people to go through this, and especially um, a lot of hip hop artists, they believe that, oh, we're in this new genre, we have new technology, we have a new status in this country, and they think they're the first people to go through this, or the first, you, you every rapper has a story, oh, my problems with my label, this fame ain't what it is, but what they went through, artists like Muddy Waters, you know, uh, artists like James Brown, Prince, Michael Jackson, all the way, Mahalia Jackson, in every genre, and in every era of black people creating art under white hegemony and capitalism 
uh, exploitation and manipulation of uh, musical artists has been a mainstay of the industry. Next in the first chapter, moving on, that's from the introduction, uh, he has a list of relevant terms. I'm not going to get into the terms, but he uh, gives um, what I call functional definitions of, of terms like misogyny and capitalism and other things that often aren't at the forefront of most people's thoughts when they think about music or, or enjoy music or consume music, but they are extremely relevant terms that we have to have a functioning and working um, understanding of. So moving on into the meat of the text, um, he, he talks about the genesis of hip hop, uh, a lot of early influences in hip hop. He talks about how the 70s and 60s impacted hip hop, where you have the 60s uh, black liberation and black uh, power struggles. And in the uh, 70s, where you have the black exploitation and disco era. In fact, if you look at a lot of the earliest hip hop groups, um, like the Fat Boys, Pioneers, their initial name was the Disco Three. And you look at Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, they dressed like disco artists. I think Run DMC is one of the first artists that have that distinctive break from the disco stylings. Brothers would be, you know, wearing chaps and feathers and, and, and tassels on everything. They look like disco artists because um, that was the disc was the record and you know everyone knows early in in in, in the inception of hip-hop going back to cool herc in fact you know the disc which means the disco meant the disc which was the 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 record disc so anyway and i went to see uh cool herc perform at um in baltimore or be more and uh i'd say a good quarter of his set was pure disco you know he brought it up to 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 hip-hop but you know um, he talks about those early influences, uh, the good old days or the, 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 the genesis or the golden era. And one artist that he spoke about in particular, who's had a great impact on my life that I had an opportunity to actually see him perform. Um, how many times? At least four. You know, one of the first uh, dates I went on with my wife uh, over 20 years ago was uh, a Gil Scott Heron. I went to see Gil Scott Heron at SOB. So he pays homage and gives respect to Gil Scott Heron and any hip hop historian or hip hop musicologist is going to shout out uh, Gil Scott Heron um, and his impact on early hip hop and on the consciousness and, and the political IQ of hip hop. So, you know, Creamer also st um, continues that um, as a hip hop musicologist to talk about um, Gil Scott Heron's impact. And then in the chapter three, he goes more into depth about the golden age of hip hop. And um, Creamer, what do we want to call him? Bernard? <laughs> Mama named him Bernard. I'm calling him Bernard. Brother Bernard states that, um, quote, hip hop's gradual degradation coincided with its being co opted by large, apathetic European distribution companies. He also states that during the golden era of hip hop, appeared confused, convoluted, and contorted. It featured a multitude of conflicting themes, but somehow that balance was maintained, which is something I never thought about, but it just became clear when I read that passage in his text where you would find everybody from Busy B, where people just, I want to rock the party and rock the house to the most um, militant political stances, to some more like uh, the first gangster rapper, um, what was his name? Uh, he he did um, Spoonie, no, Schoolie, Schoolie D? I have to look that up. I think it was Schoolie D. I'm just gonna uh, uh, cheat a little bit, but. Yeah, Schoolie D. Um, he had, he, uh, had this song called PSK, and he was credited with being the very first gangster rapper. I'm sure no matter what you state about a, a, a genre that was evolving on many fronts and had a multi, multiple genesises, you know, you had, the, the of course, the, the home of the South Bronx, but you also had people talk about Yellow Man and the, and the reggae chats and all that. But all that to say is many people credit Schooly D with being the first gangster rapper. 
And so I remember as a child, I went to see uh, a showcase of, of, of hip hop artists in the early 90s. And uh, this rapper by the name of, uh, what's his name? DJ Quick was on stage. And he was a early gangster rapper, you know, and he had this hit song called Black Pussy. But while he was on stage, um, someone from the crowd yelled out, say something positive. So even when the gangster rappers would come out, the audience would expect as as it's just like now where you had to have some gangster credentials or street hood credentials, even if you're not a hood rapper and they even pretend to, even the most gangster hood rappers would have to demonstrate their solidarity with the larger community. The Rodney King riot, a lot of the gangster rap groups came out in solidarity with the King riot. In fact, Tupac was out there riding with and, and, and uh, rebelling with the community. And uh, if you look up or Google this thing called the West Coast All-Stars, and uh, the, the gangster rappers came out with anti-violence songs. KRS-One came out with self-destructions and two weeks later beat the shit out of PM Don on, and threw him off stage. So there was this convoluted, contorted, but hip hop was literally in its infancy. And black African people are some of the most dynamic, multifaceted people in this country. In fact, everyone else gets their so-called culture from us. There's no such thing as American culture. You know, American culture, the aspects of American culture that people credit from jazz to hip hop and everything in be between is really African diaspora, the di diasporan culture. But that's a whole nother discussion. But to say he was right about the golden era, it was not this utopia. It was not every rapper was conscious or every rapper was positive and everything was positive. Dudes was, you know, carrying box cutters in my day. And, um, you know, our era was the first era they started putting metal detectors outside of clubs. I remember the first time I had to go get a wand um, down or patted down in the club. It was like in the early 90s. So not to say that the violence wasn't there, but that wasn't the, the nucleus or the core or the main idea people had with hip hop. It was very multifaceted or as uh, uh, Brother Bernard states, it, it was confused, convoluted and contorted, but it maintained a balance. But in chapter four, he talks about gangster and where gangster hip hop and gangsterism became associated with black people. Because prior to the so-called hip hop era, get gangsters was Buzzy Siegel. It was the Italian mafia and the Irish mafia and the Jew Jewish mafia. The, the, the concept or notion of gangster and gangster music was, was opera, you know, whatever the Italians were listening to or whatever the Jewish people were listening to, you know, and the Gatling gun and the drive by and the St. Valentine's Day master gangsterism was nothing that was associated with, with black men or black music in particular. You know, black music was was more identified as, uh, you know, wholesome, everything from from gospel to the blues. You know, it was down home, um, even jazz, even though jazz was considered underground music and a druggy music. It was not considered a music that promoted or, or grew out of or, or, or was a part of organized crime. scene. But I digress. Uh, Creamer talks about in 1967 just before the, the civil rights uh, legislation was, was passed, there was this thing called the Kerner Commission. And the Kerner Commission was basically a study of what the hell was wrong with black people. Why were black people rioting and rebelling? Why were black people so discontent? Why were black people no longer to, willing to passively occupy the role we've occupied since Reconstruction? of the passive second-class citizen underclass who do everything for menial labor and to entertain and enrich white folks. You know, where did this, this, this angry, dejected, unpatriotic Negro came from? So the commission concluded that the case of black rebellion, uh, where widespread economic gulf between white and black, uh, blacks were, as a result of lopsided policy and discrimination, exponentially more impoverished and unemployed than whites. So the Kerner Commission, uh, which was uh, um, funded and proposed, funded and executed by the, the LBJ of the Lyndon Baines Johnson administration, 
came to some very clear conclusion. Black people have had been historically and systematically impoverished and oppressed. The report also uh, cited federal housing initiatives that created black ghettos that lacked the resources and adequate so social programs. So black people had been kicked off of agricultural land in the South when agriculture went from from uh, pre-industrial to full-on industrial agriculture and became monopolized and, and fully integrated into the capitalist economy. So from sharecropping to industrial farms, black people have been herded into city centers, urban areas, and uh, ghettoized. Now, a lot of people associate ghetto with blackness, but Europeans have been constructing ghettos long before they came to the United States. The creation of slums and ghettos is actually European culture, not African culture. But the fact that we were oppressed under an, a Eurocentric culture, you know, just like when Hitler put the Jews in the ghettos and the slums occupy uh, uh, Europe to this day. And they just came here and the first slum occupants of the United States were like Irish immigrants, again, Italian immigrants and other Southern European immigrants. You know, anybody who wasn't a wasp in the United States for quite some time uh, wasn't even considered fully white. So, but again, I digress. Um, the ghettos lacked resources and social programs. And also a big part of black rebellion and black discontent was a hostile and predatory policing. And even though uh, President Johnson established a committee that came to these very astute and accurate conclusions about why black people uh, were not no, number one, not fulfilling the role that we once fulfilled in this country and why we were rebelling. He chose to ignore all of those because they, the, the solutions were basically give black people resources and stop imposing these these racist and discriminatory practices, institutional, legal and extra legal practices on black people. Basically, let black people along and let them thrive. Give them give us our resources, give us our due our cut and then leave us the hell alone to cultivate ourselves as a people as a community but um instead lyndon baines johnson gave us the civil rights act and the voting rights act and um to quote the uh the text uh the commission found that the riots were mostly per uh, perpetrated by blacks motivated by high self-esteem and enhanced racial pride. The majority of rioters were high school dropouts who had a higher political orientation than their peers who remained in school. The youth saw the system as their enemy, so they attacked it. So he wanted not necessarily to liberate or empower black people through his legislation, but he wanted to pacify black people. And to this day, we still seem confused about pacification and empowerment and liberation. He did not want militant blacks. He did not want black people with a quote unquote higher political orientation. And so the black people who dropped out of school didn't mean they weren't learning. They didn't mean that there were so many black bookstores. I know so many black people from that era, from that era, uh, from the 60s and 70s that mentor and educated me and just because they dropped out of school does not mean that i mean just read the autobiography of malcolm x malcolm x story reflects what a lot of black youth went through and this was also the african decolonial era this was the caribbean federation and the caribbean non-alignment era and the latin american revolution and guerrilla warfare so there was as to quote many Black Panthers, there was revolution in the air at the time. So the main goal of the Kerner Commission, even though they had a rack, and like I said, you can't fix anything with an accurate diagnosis. But just because you have an accurate diagnosis doesn't mean that you're going to implement an a, uh, appropriate care or solution. So the Kerner Commission was an accurate um, dissection of the problem, but the Civil Rights Act was a inadequate and some might argue now after over half a century of uh, hindsight that it was an insidious thing to pacify black people as opposed to empower and give us justice they gave us pacification and tokenism so um 
we're going to deal with the cultural and aspect of that in this text because there are economic and other aspects which he will touch on but we're going to mainly focus on the cultural aspect so in that time after the post civil rights the post voting rights era you had uh black exploitation and Brother Bernard asserts that black exploitation derailed black power, just like gangster rap derailed the awakening of golden era hip hop. Um, the text states that young Buck attempted to release a song or an album that focused on terrorism committed by police in America, but it was rejected by Jimmy Ivon of Interscope Records, who insisted that the song might create an unsafe environment for police. And the author goes on to state that how did Jimmy Ivon, who is the godfather of gangster rap, uh, the true godfather. And it's always funny to me when people talk about the goat of hip hop or the goat of R&B. And it, I always think to myself, the goat of R&B is not a singer. It's, it's some man, some European or Jewish man. Because when I think about the goat, I'm saying the person who has the most power and has generated the most income from something. <laughs> you know, so, you know, the goat of hip hop is a, is, is a white man. You know, the goat of, of, of R&B is some white dude that never rap, never sing, because they, they have the power to control, direct, and determine who gets to do what and when and where, and they generate the most income from it. So if that don't make you the goat of something, I don't know what does, but I digress. Um, how could Jimmy Iovine identify that the fact that you're making music that points out the atrocities the police commit about black people might create an unsafe environment for police. But that same logic didn't apply when you made literally thousands of records by hundreds of artists that promoted the, 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 the murder, uh, intimidation, exploitation of black people. But that didn't create a uh, unsafe environment for the entire black community. So anyway, uh, there was another where he points out uh, Too Short. I and mean, if I got to tell you who Too Short is, then, you know, you shouldn't even be listening to a discussion about a book on hip hop. But Too Short wanted to go positive. And they they told him, nope, keep making pimps holes music. Uh, there was a time when when Lil Wayne, who was the biggest artist in the world at the time, was like he learned to taught himself to play the the electric guitar and wanted to become a rock, a true rock star and, and do rock music. And he's like, nope, keep rapping about destroying black people and i just heard a song he did with this guy he seemed to be of persian or arab descent you know saying the most heinous things about black women i mean he's in a grown-ass man now and been rich forever and he's still doing the same minstrel music so um it's it's very clear that the 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 corporate interests the white elites who dominate and direct hip-hop are very aware of the negative impact of music can have and they direct and orient so-called our artists. I don't know why we call them. I guess we can call them black artists, but they don't belong to us. They don't represent us. But these these artists or these performers or these minstrels, they direct them to make music that is contrary to the interests of black people. But they will not allow them to make music hostile to other groups because they say that music if you make music hostile to other groups, it will create a quote unquote unsafe environment for those groups. So take that as you will. But the author states, once you've dehumanized the people through the use of negative propaganda campaign, it allows the dehumanizing to, uh, to be treated as disposal. Oh, wait, I misspelled in my notes. <laughs> okay, let me restart. Once you dehumanize the people through the use of negative propaganda campaigns, it allows the dehumanized to be treated as disposable without being any resistance from those witnessing it. And that basically means if you can create a campaign or art or, or a conclusion that these people are subhuman, whatever you do to those people, the other people who observe you attacking those people will not intervene. And that goes back to Nazi Germany. Long before any Jew was put in a concentration camp or, or a slave labor camp or, or a gas oven, the, the Nazis embarked on a relentless campaign to demonize uh, the, the, the Jews in there within Germany, Poland, throughout Central Europe. And uh, 
after the demonization campaign, people were snitching out and ratting out their neighbors. There are many people, the Jews were fully integrated in Germany. Many uh, Aryans were married to Jews and they would leave their spouse. So the and one of the chief means that um, the Nazis used to uh, dehumanize the Jews was to point to the rest of the Germans uh, how Jewish art, Jewish music and painting and, and film was quote unquote degenerate. And they said these people make degenerate art and, and they make degenerate art be, because to, to, to weaken and deteriorate the morals and values of our society. And, and you look that up, there's a documentary, uh, it's in German, but it's, they have subtitle versions called The Eternal Jew. And everything that Hitler said about Jew, Jewish degenerate art and its impact on the larger German society it's the same thing many conservatives, right wingers, and some white liberals say about black art and black music and its impact on wholesome Christian American society. But moving on, um, he talks a, a lot about NWA, and of course, you can't talk about gangster rap without NWA. Um, NWA is not the first gangster rap group, but they were the first gangster rap to sell millions of records to white kids. And what's funny about NWA, as I call it, is NWA is submission masquerading as rebellion. If you look at the persona that NWA has now, these bad mofos, these dudes who didn't take no shit from anybody, but if you look beyond the surface, and I ain't just talking about the fact that who Jerry Heller, the man who, who controlled and pimped the group, I'm not even talking about the record labels that pimped them, I'm talking about the content of their music and the persona that they portrayed. They were not rebelling against the system because the, they were everything the system wanted a black man to be. Life ain't nothing but bitches and money. You know, they conducted themselves in the manner that was consistent with the stereotype that the rest of white America had of us. So like the Black Panther and Kwame Ture, Chairman Fred Hampton, these men went contrary to what white people envisioned a black man to be or not to be. But the NWA, in the way they dress, the way they, and what's crazy about that is Ice Cube, he had to get permission to leave college to go on his tour with NWA. He was a middle class kid. You know, if you look, and we all know, uh, if you look at Dr. Dre and Yella, and you go look at their rare world class res, wrecking crew, these guys, before they were wearing gangster Raider caps, they were wearing sequins and lace and glitter and dressing up like doctors, literally playing doctors. So these weren't real gangsters. So NWA was submission masquerading as rebellion. So when people would listen to and, and, and start to mimic NWA, they thought, yeah, I'm, put, I'm sticking it to the man, but actually you were falling right into the uh, agenda. You know, gangster rap is literally white pleasure from black pain. Um, and the author goes on to state that at the end of the day, I do not totally fault black kids uh, from marginal economic backgrounds for accepting a stack of cash for recording executives, from recording executives to prompt misogyny and violence. Now me, I do fault them. No forgiveness for, for traitors during wartime. Like if black people weren't oppressed, if black people were living under uh, African governance uh, in an ecological, uh, humane economy and functioning and not under a campaign of genocide, and somebody goes off and makes some dirty music or what was called in my grandmother's day, blue music. Hey, whatever. You know, that's just a guy, you know, he's he does that. But me personally, I have to step away from the author because a lot of these guys were were not just. You know. Kids with growling bellies. Now, I know personally some dudes who 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 started rapping to make money because I know guys that started rapping or or, or hustling. To, to buy toothpaste or get their mother's lives, lights turned back on. But many of these rappers came from middle class and upper middle class families, you know, who, who were, were, were taught music, who came from stable homes and, and they mimicked even, you know, Biggie Smalls talking about, I used to eat sardines for dinner. His mother came out and was like, he never had, so you look at <laughs> Biggie, you know, he didn't have sardines for dinner. So uh, the author is, is quite understanding and, you know, I respect that point of view. And if I felt that way, I would say that. But I, I see them as, as as race traitors. And I think 
the uh, you know, there's never an excuse to. I think that history will not look favorable on the people who were making murder, degenerate murder music during the era of the new Jim Crow. I mean, just imagine during chattel slavery, some black man wrote a song called Crap the Whip Harder, you know, and 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 making songs about, you know, I'm a house nigga and I snitch on the out on the field slaves. I mean, you're literally in the midst of 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 a of a genocidal campaign against African people, uh, mass incarceration, the new Jim Crow, and you're making music to justify fuel and 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 to drive black people deeper into that despair. So I do fault them and I don't forgive them, but but the author, you know, you 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 race traders, uh, the the author of Who Stole the Soul, is willing to to give y'all the benefit of the doubt. But I know most of y'all weren't, you know, marginal economic backgrounds. You know, many of y'all. I wouldn't say most. There were some DMX definitely came from hardship, and 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 there there are some rappers that were quote unquote really about that life, or really came from nowhere, came from started from the bottom. But many of them didn't, you know, and their parents tried the best they could, you know. And even though I grew up in a housing project, 90 percent of the kids in the housing projects were not about that life. You know, I'm a living example of that. You know, my grandmother did the best she could. She made sure I did my homework and I went to school and I was in church on Sunday. The best she did, the best she could. So and a lot of black kids um, had alternatives of making more constructive music. You know, and maybe you wouldn't have been a millionaire megastar, but you could be a thousandaire, you know, person who can take care of your your basic needs while contributing positive uh, content to the community. But what on going on? He does offer uh, some some countermeasures to the proliferation and saturation of, of gangster rap. He states that we have to target the industry, expose the industry, attack the industry. We have to educate children, which is what I've always done. I didn't really take the approach where I was, wanted to um, censor what my children could listen to because it's it's damn near impossible. And a lot of these shitty ass rappers talk about, um, oh, you can just uh, don't listen to my music. And you know, I'm not a people's parent. I'm not a role model. Um Cardi B and Nicki Minaj and and of course all these uh, Snoop Dogg and, and and Drake, they all say, well, I'm not responsible for your kids. But we know in this society, you know, the African value system is it takes a village. And so if you're going to be like, no, I'm going to prey on the village instead of contribute positively to the village. OK, we should acknowledge that, too, and, and take appropriate action. But I chose to not censor my children. I let them to listen to, you know, within limits, I mean, which within age limits, but even that in the internet age where every child has a supercomputer and access to everything on the net in their pocket, but media in, uh, interpretation, media analysis, media comprehension. So, you know, educate children. And he said, hold artists accountable, which is, uh, a major one we could do easily. Black people, you know, we could hold these artists accountable without having to march in the streets and get tear gassed and, and, and billy clubs. We could just, you know, collectively turn our backs. But it seems the more that the artist disrespects the African collective, the more popular they become. So anyway. Uh, and another quote I have to say the share from the author is he said that gangster rap is simply the manifestation of the marginalized mimicking the dominant dominant culture. So basically, I'm so happy to say this because I always say, you know, when we talk about cultural appropriation, gangsterism is not our culture. Disrespecting African women is not our culture. Hyper consumerism and materialism is not our culture. So most gangster rap that we think is black is actually these artists are mimicking white people and they don't even hide it. You know, I remember in the 90s, they used to talk about the Haitian Sicilians or Bugsy Siegel, Benny Siegel. There was even a rapper called Al Capone and Murder Incorporated, Crime Syndicate. They have all these goddamn names from 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 alien cultures, oppressive racist groups that that they uh, adopt and fully embrace. Um he, uh, but let's move on. Uh, that was the gangster rap chapter. Very, I could just do the rest of the, the presentation on the gangster rap, but there's so much more. Uh, in chapter six, he goes back to birth of a nation and he talks about negative black propaganda in the era of since 
emancipation. So since uh, the post-Reconstruction era up till now, they talked about how uh, Black people have been portrayed as subhuman, violent, sexually uncontrolled. And he takes that all the way back to D.W. Griffin's movie, Birth of a Nation, which is also online. You can go and watch the movie if you can uh, stomach it. But uh, it is insane how the the portrayals in hip hop today, Kodak Black, if, if we have to call names, these minstrel characters, Gucci Mane, are almost identical to the, the dehumanizing the dehumanizing depictions of Africans in the movie Birth of a Nation. And we're not talking about the, the uh, Nat Turner biopic that came out a couple of years ago. We're talking about the movie that came out in, in the, uh, the first movie. In fact, the very first movie ever shown in the White House under the, uh, the Woodson. Who was it? Yeah, the Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, the Wilson administration showed this film in the White House. So look up D.W. Griffith uh, and uh, Black Minstrels and the portrayal of Black men in, in, in American society from the post-Reconstruction Jim Crow era to right now today. And, and the overlaps will shake you to your core. Uh, he goes into greater detail in chapter seven on uh, black exploitation movies in the 70s, where he stated that black exploitation movies were a Trojan horse uh, to to get a lot of backwards ideas or counter revolutionary reactionary ideas into the minds of black people, where he literally says that that black exploitation in the 70s was a Trojan horse uh, and the minds of black people was the city of Troy that the movies were used. Because if you look at the old black story exploitation movie, they had black people in Afros. They had black people that looked like Black Panthers, that looked like um, black nationalists, conscious militant people. But they were on the screen doing some of the most backward shit. One of my favorite movies uh, from that era is uh, The Black Gustavo where you had a black man who was taking the, the, these dirty cops, had assaulted a black woman, and the black Gustavo went and, and, and literally castrated these racist uh, white cops that had violated this black woman. But in the long run, he became worse than the oppressor, which was a history in a lot of, you know, Zimbabwe, a lot of African nations were liberated by black people only to have the black people mimic the, the former co colonizers. But let's stay on track. So he calls out, uh, he calls out black exploitation and the role it played in warping or twisting uh, the civil rights movement, the black liberation struggle, and the minds of black people and our self perception. He also talks about, and this is where one of my first diversions from the author, Brother Creamer, and this this is not nothing personal, but I just. I don't see that this holds up. And what I say is he stresses the ownership of our own media. He talks quite a bit about first in chapter seven, but going on, he asserts that us owning our own media would somehow allow us to have more control over the content and just ultimately lead to better quality and better content in black media if we would stress ownership of our own media. But I have two words. Tyler Perry, you know, that to, 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 to counter that assertion or cash money, two more words, two more words, ruthless records, two more words, bad boy. You know, I think more important than media, media ownership is revolutionary ideology. I think revolutionary ideology, if, if I had a button I could push to say, well, you can have almost revolutionary, universal revolutionary ideology or universal black media ownership, I push the ideology ideology button first. And I'm not saying we shouldn't work to own what belongs to us, but I don't think that that's inherently revolutionary because we have, I mean, going back to Motown records, we've had that. And many of the, the even Kanye now is coming out with a whole new revolutionary form with that, that, that diss music thing that his Donda 2 record is coming on. And people are already questioning how are the you know, if you know a Kanye record, you know, all he has is samples and, and, and ghost writers. And it'd take a million to one people to make a Kanye solo album. And many of his people don't get paid. Many of his co collaborators, principal, you know, uh, have stopped working with him. 
shout out to those principled collaborators that walked away from him when he just fully exposed his his uh, race treason. But that's another discussion. All I'm saying is I don't see where ownership, maybe communal or collective ownership, but ownership under capitalism has of, of black people owning labels or media studios under capitalism, radio stations. We look at radio, iHeartRadio or Radio One. I just don't agree with him with that. Uh, I understand why, and he's very clear on why he um, advocates for media ownership or stresses from the book, media ownership. It's just, I haven't seen ownership play out um, as an asset for black empowerment. Now, black enrichment, that's another thing. A lot of black folks then got rich, but empowerment or liberation, I haven't seen as much as that. So, but moving on. Um, in chapter eight, he articulates that context matters. To quote the author, um, if we were not actively fighting uh, to maintain our self-esteem, we are involuntarily surrendering it. So there's no such thing as passivity in this system in any way, because we're under attack in all fronts. So we have to actively fight to maintain our self-esteem or we're going to surrender it. This system is constantly eroding you. And I know a lot of black folks want to just be like, hey, I got to fight nonstop. No, you don't have to. You can surrender. But the author does have a chapter that we'll come to called The Beautiful Struggle. So being in perpetual struggle and perpetual self-development and cultivation doesn't have to be looked at as a negative thing. Moving on, he goes into some details of the science of sound waves, uh, the atonal, 12 atonal system, which is interesting. Uh, it's kind of far out there, but how music sound waves and the vibrations impact, you know, your your uh, central nervous system and, and your conscious and subconscious. Um, and he also talks about, you know, the secret relationship between black and Jews which I would like to discuss that with him on when I have him on for the Q&A session. But, you know, I want to kind of get into some of these other points. How, how are we doing on time? OK, we're doing pretty good on time. All right. So keep pro progressing. One of my favorite chapters, being that I am a dyed in the wool uh, socialist, is where he talks about the capitalist con game. Chapter 11, the capitalist con game. Uh, the author states that we have embraced the idea of earning the right to live as if that right is not inherent from birth. I mean, that says it all. You know, um, it's incredible to me how black people um, have completely submitted to the idea of, of money, value and worth as defined by our oppressor. The author states that two forms of peonage are debt and wage wage slavery and debt slavery. He states that I quote, um, corporate corrupted and co-opted hip hop has not escaped becoming a vessel to create ma the maniac materialistic. So the things that you want, the, th the things that you desire, hip hop is one unending commercial promotion. It is crazy. Um, he goes on to state just a few of the products. I remember when I was a kid, one of the first, when I first heard Run DMC, and he said, Calvin Klein ain't no friend of mine, don't want nobody's name on my behind. Hip hop was anti-materialism. Like if you out here wearing labels, that was considered corny. The big thing in hip hop was to make your own style. So even if you bought something, you try to tweak it or freak it to make it your own. But here comes capitalism, that same group that said Calvin Klein ain't no friend of mine, don't want nobody's name on my behind. That same group was one of the first groups to get a corporate endorsement deal. My Adidas. You know, and I got so many rhymes in my head, Boogie Down Productions, so many of the pioneering groups would, would um, mock or dismiss uh, materialism or, or identifying yourself with a label um we call it everything from corny to whack to turning around to being literally corporate put uh, uh promoters and now the promotion of of corporate multinational products and and services is synonymous with hip-hop um he lists some some products that jay-z 
promotes in his song. And just to list a few, in his songs, in his albums, Jay-Z promotes Mercedes Benz, Crystal, Maybach, and I think Maybach and the Benz are the same thing, BMW, Gucci, the Glock, Bentley, Nike, Range Rover, Rolex, Porsche, Versace, Tom Ford, and Intertech, Intratech, which is another gun manufacturer. The list goes on and on. That's just a few <laughs> that... that um, the author sat down and listened and, and, and listened to Jay-Z's catalog and listing all the pro products he promotes. And just ask yourself, besides what he owns, his corporate label, but even when you talk, Jay-Z's trying to promote something that he owns, you, you all remember that image where he was, he had that streaming he has, I don't know what the status is, of title, I believe. And he showed his staff, he was talking all this shit about black owned and we black owned, black owned, blackity black and black artists, black artists. And then the whole staff behind him and Beyonce were white, you know? So it, it, it's a hustle, it's a scam, it's cosmetic. But um, he quotes uh, the consumer or to quote the author, the consumer is conned into believing that his or her ravenous consumption is based on his or her individual preference. So they turn you into a consumer and they trick you into believing these items that you consume are based on your own desire. They came out of your own imagination, which is an illusion. Oh, I, I like Gucci. Why? Because that's just what I like. <laughs> and and, and I'm, even me. Everybody, we all, especially as African people under capitalist mass propaganda, need to examine our desires and wants. When you go out and get a Gucci belt, and I ain't saying you can't have a Gucci belt. I'm just saying you have to really understand why do I feel better with a Gucci belt as opposed to just some, you know, like I used to, which I haven't been to in so long. I used to go to the uh, the cultural African arts festival and get those hand woven Rasta belts. You know, those were hot in my day when I was a kid. You know, you get the belt and tie it over red, gold and green, red, black and green. Why do you get more pride or self-esteem from from a Gucci belt? You know, these I uh, this Italian uh, high couture than you get from something that's crafted by African hands. Is it truly just your own individual uh, preference or is it something more insidious or, or more that that deserves more? Um, examination chapter 12 he talks about the soul controller and by soul it's a play on words and not s o u l but s o l e meaning the the one controller or the single controller uh and this chapter deals with media monopolies and it is an ongoing extension of the capitalist con game uh he talks about how there's this fake image that you have these diverse record labels, these diverse media companies, these diverse products. But when you look beneath the cover, you see they're all pretty much uh, subsidiaries of these large umbrella companies. So the vast majority of the media that we consume, whether it's news, whether it's entertainment, whether it's music or movies, it's under... Uh, four to six multinational corporations that black people have very little ownership or stake in. He talks about under the Bill Clinton uh, 1996 Telecommunications Act is where media consolidation, because before there were strict regulations about media ownership, where if you own a radio station in a region, you can own a radio station and a newspaper and a, uh, uh, and a, uh, television station all in the same media market to basically anti-monopolistic legislation um even though in 1996 the clinton telecommunication acts created uh monopolies under the reagan administration i think carter was the last president to really enforce uh jimmy carter who was elected in what the 70s or yeah, he was elected in the 70s, was the last U.S. president to enforce anti-monopoly anti -monopoly laws and policies. So Reagan started just ignoring the laws and um, Bill Clinton made it official. So uh, he talks about the history of black media and how black people um, and, and where I support this black media ownership. He talks about Marcus Garvey and the Negro world and Frederick Douglass, the North Star, and how black owned media 
was able to communicate black people's concerns and give a true representation of black people's interests, black people's culture, black people's lives under Jim Crow, um, Reconstruction, Civil Rights America. And but, you know, Rockefeller record ain't no North Star, you know, so I understand where the history that black media ownership was something that empowered and, and edified African people. But you can't really point to that today unless you're dealing with something like Marcus Klein, Frontline magazine and some small indie publication. But these corporate blacks, you know, capitalist blacks just ain't, ain't there for us. So um, when you consume media and you think you have a diverse options, understand that there's a large umbrella and a singular agenda, capitalist anti-African agenda that uh, controls just about all the media you consume, unless you're consuming independent, under-supported, under-represented, underfunded media like Bro Diallo or these independent publications like Who Stole the Soul. If it ain't something that's absolutely underpin independent, and that's why you need to support and buy these books, support uh, these broadcasts so that we can have uh, this underground media become more prominent and, and a more powerful voice for our people. Going on to chapter 13, uh, we deal with propaganda. And um, the first thing out of that propaganda chapter is that our collective inaction is unnatural, uh, Creamer states. You know, the author says our collective inaction is unnatural. So it is something manufactured, constructed. And he goes on to say, when the mass consumption of negative propaganda is partnered with environmental depravity, depression, and disenfranchisement, often the result contributes to the criminality which frees the criminal justice system and helps submit the status quo. That means there was a, uh, um, I believe it was, let me just uh, check something around. I just don't want to, these guys start to, to jumble. The, the father of modern behaviorism. Uh, yeah, John B. Watson it wasn't Skinner. I don't know why Skinner stuck in my head. But John B. Watson said that, uh, give me my own specified world. He said, give me a dozen healthy infants and my own specified world, and I can turn them people into whatever I want them to be. Let me just read the quote directly. It's over here. Give me a dozen healthy infants, well-formed, in my own specified world to bring them up in, and I'll guarantee to take anyone at random and train him to become any type of specialist I might select. Doctor, lawyer, artist, merchant, chief, and yes, even a beggar man and thief, regardless of his talents and pretense. And it goes on from there. And... As Bobby e. Wright pointed out, white people have their own specified world. And so if white people in their own specified world say we want black people to be a permanent underclass, we want them to fill our prisons, we want them to entertain and enrich us. They have their own specified world so they can create the conditions to, as he says, become a type of specialist. And so as the author here, Bernard, points out, you know, we're mass consuming their propaganda and becoming exactly what they want us to be to serve whatever agendas, insidious agendas they have. So when he says that our actions, our behaviors are unnatural, that feeds into that. So if you're going to not serve, you have to consciously be African deliberately and relentlessly fight for your African consciousness and to direct your interest in your own family, your own personal and your own people's best interests. Because you can't just passively, hey, I'm going to get this money. Oh, well, I'm going to make sure I got good credit. I'm going to be a high value man. I'm going to be a girl boss. Because if you're just following the script, you're inevitably, I don't care how wholesome you are. I don't care how, you know, there was this meme talking about a black man, uh, who reads books and takes care of his kids is, is a dangerous man. No, you're not. If you're just an ethical cog in the machine, if you're a cog in the machine, you're the cog in a genocidal machine. 
So if you're not consciously rebelling, consciously revolutionary, you are working against your own interest and the interest of your people and interest of your dis, uh, descendants. The book also and the author also states African people are programmed for self-loathing, self-hatred. African youth in many regards are programmed to self-destruct. And not only do they program us to self-destruct, menticide and genocide, they, pro they profit from our dysfunction. So understanding that that is the environment you live in. And so I just had a brother come in my comment section the other day. He was like, why are you so negative? I'm just honest. Reality is negative, not me. In fact, I want things to improve. I'm positive. You know, I get so much the opposite. I think I'm positive. I think I'm trying to make positive change. But when, when you're under oppression, the only, you know, the truth will set us free. We got to be honest. You know, I can't get on here, oh, uh, uh, positive vibrations and peace and the universe will 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 summon or what is that speak or manifest and all that bullshit. You know, I have to be honest and, and I appreciate there's other people being honest and telling the unnecessary truth. I don't see this as negative. I see this as accurate. I don't think we should focus. Is this negative or positive? Does it make me feel good or bad? I think we say, is this an accurate analysis or an inaccurate analysis? Now, before I get closer to the conclusion, we're, 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 we got a few more chapters to go. I want to talk about a couple of things that I disagree with in, in the text that I would look forward to discussing. Number one, the artist, I mean, the Arthur, Bernard Creamer states that black artists are often forced to belittle themselves and the people for the sake of being uh, employed entertainers. But I would say we have other options. We have agency. One of my favorite MCs, uh, Boots Riley, who was an active communist. He says, I'm a communist. I tell your mama the truth. And now they want to assassinate me like John Wilf Boot. He had a full on career and never compromised. He doesn't even say the N word. He has one record that came out on his first album. And basically it's a song articulating that he will not use the word nigga. And so that's the one song that has nigga in it where he talks about I ain't the nigga and I won't use that word. There's a verse in that song that said nigga hasn't always been a man with melanin. It used to be a piece of wood that sat on a cotton gin. Master put it there and it wouldn't move smooth. So what does it mean to be a nigga with an attitude? So go look that song up. So anyway, I'm just saying there's an artist who's has like 10 to a dozen albums out that hasn't degraded, dehumanized or harmed black people. You can definitely have a career without and, and even if you want to go tour the world and all of that, you, like I said, you're not going to have multi platinum. Uh, uh, Boots Riley might never get a platinum plaque. He might have to when he goes to 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 perform, he might have to fly charter instead of. I mean, fly coach instead of charter jets. He may not be popping bottles with models, but he has, you can have a career and be revolutionary, progressive. You can tell the goddamn truth to the people. So I, I uh, don't believe that they're forced. I believe these traders volunteer. I don't think there was any brother just sitting in the hood or rapping in the studio and they came. And one of the reasons they also don't force them is it's too many to force. For every rapper that says, no, nah, I'm not going to uh, sell out my, my people. I mean, he are, but you can be a successful, conscious, progressive artist. Dead Prez, one of the most successful and respected group, and they maintain their integrity. Even they say a lot of things I disagree with, but they had a successful career, and they're close to being a household name. And um, even then, you, you don't even have to be talking revolutionary all the time or you know, you have people like Dale the Funky Homo Sapien, who nobody would probably say he's a militant black man, but he, he makes really good. The whole hieroglyphic crew, the independent, uh, progressive. I mean, they do have some some bangers like all things ain't what they seem. You get washed even if you're way too clean. But they talk about everything from the Illuminati to insidious agendas and they make fun party music. You know, they make they make uh, head nodding music. All I'm saying is 
I just haven't seen being a, a, a fan of hip hop, been to so many hip hop concerts in my, my youth and even recently that my hearing to this day is damaged. You know, um, I've been to see uh, even in places like Missouri, uh, Atlanta, New York City, California, I've been all over this country and been been with the hip hop and progressive hip hop community. You can have a career. I don't think that anyone is forced to belittle our people. Again, I don't think these 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 rappers make music to to feed into to our oppressors genocide agenda are victims. I call them vectors. And the difference between a victim is a vector is a victim is someone who is harmed or infected and a vector is someone who is harmed or affected, and instead of trying to heal from that harm and infection, they seek to spread it around to other people. So I disagree with that, and I look forward to talking to you more about in 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 uh, your your assertion in chapter thirteen that that these artists are forced to belittle themselves and their people. Another thing I disagree with is uh, where you state um, where the author states. I'm talking to him already. Uh, this reflects the fact that black people do not own major production studios or any major distribution needed uh, to one's work. You know, I don't think the problem is the lack of black ownership. I just don't. And and so, you know, you, you, you refer back to black ownership as one of the solutions, but maybe that's the socialist in me when just the word own <laughs> just bothers me. But I'd like, I look forward to discussing that with the author. So those are a couple of points that I disagree with. Well, so, you know, out of the literally thousands of really strong, powerful points and in, in enlightenment in this book, those are the two stickler points. But they, I, I got to talk about them because he kind of goes back to that whole the, the artists aren't these grown ass men aren't full. These multimillionaire and some billionaire men are somehow still unwill, unwitting or unwilling victims. And more black ownership means less black genocidal music. I just don't see that. Uh, going on to chapter 14, uh, clandestine acts, to quote the author, he states that the media we embrace as entertainment is saturated with black genocide. So, you know, you say, you know, these people are forced to participate in black genocide. And I don't know. I don't know about that. You know, and, and, and we've always and I understand African people. We, we, we tend to look for the best. We are a very optimistic and cheerful people and we don't like to exclude our own people or to, to, to attack our own people, especially conscious revolutionary black people. But we have traitors and there's, there, there's a such thing as traitors. And I think, you know, as Del Jones said, never let a traitor go unpunished. And every traitor is not just some misguided dupe or somebody who had no other options. Some people actively betray us because they want the rewards that come with treats. But yes, the media we embrace is saturated with genocide. And I have to say this in their agenda, to oppress black people, white people have more allies than enemies. And I'll just let that marinate. Um, in chapter 15, he talks about the new blackface. He reiterates the fact that there was never a, what you call a native or intrinsic or a black demand for genocidal hip hop, anti-social hip hop. He states that the people who demanded and laid the groundwork for gangster rap, anti-human reactionary black music to become the predominant art form were white record executives. He also states, who is another famous quote, well, this is the author quoting another scholar uh, in chapter 16. He said, words cannot change reality, but they can change how people perceive reality. That's Dr. Uh, Jack Schaefer said that. You know, so even if, you know, I may not, I might say, you know, there's a threat around every corner. You know, my son's going outside and I'm saying, son, there's a threat around every corner. You know, people are, everybody's out to get you. Now, if there, if there are no people out there to get them, get him. That's not me saying that it's not going to make those people materialize, but it will make him more cautious or more fearful, more insecure, or make him not want to go out. So his perception has changed, even though the reality remains the same. And even though it doesn't change reality, we all know the quote, perception is reality. Also in conditioning, he makes a strong push to stop 
using the N-word. Uh, he states that uh, he gives her own biographical. There's not much biography in this. You know, it's a lot of Scott, like solid scholarship where he doesn't really talk about his personal experience much. But in, in the uh, chapter 16, he does talk about um, that he stopped saying the N-word or, or, or as uh, Kwabana states, he stopped dropping N-bombs uh, almost a decade ago. He doesn't use that word in casual or daily language. And he said it has definitely had an impact on his psyche and his psychological well-being. So I look forward to talking with him about that. But, you know, he goes into detail. And so, I, you know, it's, it's just very interesting uh, to to hear that. And he encourages black people to to stop using that word and stop supporting those who do use that word. Um, he goes on in chapter 17 to talk about connecting the dots. One thing he, before I get into connecting the dots, he talks about the song Dope Man. And this is a minor disagreement. Um, he said that Dope Man promoted crack. Now, NWA definitely promoted the crack academic and crack selling. But I always, from the first time I heard Dope Man, I was an adolescent. You know, I was a little kid, maybe 10, 11 years old, and I heard Dope Man. And to me, when I heard that song outside of the whole, the large, I heard it on cassette tape. And I didn't even really know when I first heard Dope Man, they had sampled, if you listen to the original track, they had sampled a lot of Public Enemy and other, it's not about a salary, it's all about reality. I thought that they were affiliated with Boogie Down Production and Public Enemy because if you listen to Dope Man, Boys in the Hood, they sampled so much East Coast hip hop. I thought N.W.A. was another East Coast group. But anyway, when I heard Dope Man, I thought that was an anti-drug song because it's a horrible song. And at the end, yo, Mr. Dope Man, you think you slick. You sold crack to my sister and now she's sick. And if she happens to die because of your drugs, I'm putting in your cool law a 38 slug. Like literally the dope man is gets killed at the end. And then the things he says about the 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 the, the, the man's wife is on drugs and, and performing sex acts when he gets home and the 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 the, the, the rape and the violence and that song to me. I would, if you ask me then, and even now when I think about the song, I know the whole song. It was once said by a man who wouldn't quit. You know, I know the whole, I'm the dope man, yeah, boy, wear corduroy. Money up to here, but unemployed. You keep smoking that pipe and my pocket gets bigger. I know the whole song by heart. And it's, to me, and we can debate this, it's an anti-drug song. Because it's such a horrendous visual story. It's such a horrendous visceral story that literally you could never get me to sell no crack. I wanted no parts. There was nothing glamorous about Dope Man, but that's a, that's a, that's a nitpick. But I kind of thought that was funny that he was like, it promoted crack. And I'm like, that was the most anti-crack song in my personal experience. I know some other people might hear it and be like, wow. But if you can listen to Dope Man and be like, this is a glamorous song. I want this in my life. Then you something else. Cause it made me be like, man, I ain't messing with crack. That's one of the main songs more so than crack killed apple jack he jumped in and he couldn't jump back dope man to me whenever i was tempted whenever i was in the streets and about trying to hustle drugs or do drugs dope man would come into my mind and i'm like i want no parts of that but anyway back to the message at hand um the author states uh talks about the uh nixon starting the war on drugs and how that that played a large role in creating the idea of a criminal associating drugs with black people and drug addiction and the crazed drug addict and all of that came out of the Nixon administration because Nixon wanted to subvert black people. And they're like, well, black people got the vote, black people, uh, uh, legal segregation. Uh, they have other reforms coming down the pipeline or already enacted from voting to, to job to access to, to higher learning. So how do we attack black people when we can't do it legally? How do we make it look like instead of attacking black people and enforcing racism, they decided to create this thing called this concept called law, law and order. So they came up with the war on drugs and later the Reaganomics and later the, the, the criminal justice reform omnibus crime bill under Bill Clinton. So in the connecting the dots chapter, he 
describes systematic racism, institutional racism, and the campaign of genocide that's been carried out to black people. I lived through it. And some of you younger people are coming in on the tail end of it. Some of y'all lived through it. Y'all remember how the community was before uh, Reagan got his hands on us. You know, how vibrant a lot, even the so-called hoods and poor black communities, the quality of black public schools in the 80s versus the quality of now, the quality of black music, the quality of our communities versus now. This is not by accident, as he stated way back in, in, in the earlier chapters. This is not a natural condition for black people. We didn't ri arrive here by accident. We de were deliberately herded, pushed, forced into this uh, situation. And we're not going to get out of it by individual goodness, individual hard work and securing the bag. This government, this state, white people as a collectively conspired against us. And we have to collectively conspire to come back. There is no individual solution to collective problems. We're going, oh, wow. Okay, we're, we're a little over. Okay, let's, let's keep going. We get to um, the bigger picture in chapter 18. Uh, one more thing. I know I keep bumping heads. Uh, the author states that the use of violent video games dulled the human propensity towards compassion for other humans. Now, I have compassion for other humans and animals, being a tree-hugging, vegan, uh, anti-violence individual that I am. And I play Mortal Kombat, and nothing makes brings me more joy than to execute a fatality in Mortal Kombat. I just don't see it. And there's science to support, I guess, whatever you want. I guess you can find science is a commodity now. Your facts are a commodity. But, I, you know, that's another thing we can discuss. I don't feel and my sons play video games and my sons are very humane and, and and you know i ain't gonna start bragging on my boys but they are some of the most mindful and humane and 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 uh just good boys but they play video games so uh that's another thing he also talks about the pro athlete um rare uh arrested development for pro athletes in um well this is my term infantilization you know, you got these brothers with these very powerful bodies and they're some of the most influential men in the world. And the best they can do is consume trinkets and, and act like children, you know, instead of using their wealth for uh, black power and liberation. Um, but we'll, we'll get a little bit more into that because um, the author does state, uh, quote, black billionaires can accomplish a lot for their own communities. I Again, I don't see how, because unless they commit class suicide, because the number one goal of a black billionaire is to sustain black billions. And the only way to sustain billionaire status is to sustain capitalism. And the only way to sustain capitalism is to sustain white hegemony. So if a black billionaire is acting in the interest of his, his class which is the billionaire class he has to act against black people and if he acts on behalf of black people he's going to subvert his class so that you know that's that uh contradiction so unless a black billionaire commits class suicide so we can't really depend on black billionaires because the moment they decide, hey, I'm going to join my people, their billionaire status will immediately fade. Immediately. Because number one, and, and the thing about wealth is what's as important as earning the money is sustaining and growing the money. And you can only sustain and grow money in the capitalist system through hyper exploitation of resources and people. So when he says black billionaires can accomplish a lot, all they can do is what I call vanity projects, open a little school, but not teach revolutionary ideology in that school, pass out some turkeys, you know, but not subvert the industrial food system. You know, even show up at a gas station and say, oh, everybody to come to the gas station, I'll buy your gas, but you can't overthrow the fossil fuel industry. So you can do token and vanity stuff. So I don't think that this is going to be a billionaire funded or billionaire led or even billion, black billionaire supported struggle. 
in fact, if you look at the poweronomics movement by Dr. Claude Anderson from a couple of decades ago, the first thing he did was go reach out to the wealthy blacks. And the wealthy blacks told him to step off. And the wealthy blacks literally told Dr. Claude Anderson when he tried to implement his poweronomics uh, program through funding through wealthy blacks is I can't support anything that too, that's too black because it will harm me representing collective interests will subvert my personal interest or my class interest. So if you are part of the mega elite class, you know, I think everything from poor working class up to middle class is where we're going to have to cultivate this movement. Now, uh, amongst ourselves, we collectively have enough wealth to, to fund ourselves if we reorient and prioritize properly. But as far as a grip, there was a book written by, um, can't remember his name. Oh, what's his name? He used to run for president all the time. It's a horrible book. Here it is by Ralph Nader. I can't believe I couldn't remember his name. He wrote a book called Only the Super Rich Can Save Us. <laughs> And he had this grand scheme. The book is well laid out. I have to, I don't, I don't think I have, I, yeah, I got a copy from the library. I didn't want to write, uh, pay money for that book, but maybe I can find it free since it's a few years old. Maybe I can find a PDF or something, but I want to review this book. But basically he had this well laid out, well researched, systematic plan. And one of the super rich he wanted to be part of his Only the Super Rich Can Save Us by Ralph Later was Bill Cosby. So this was even before Bill Cosby justifiably fell from grace. The book was published in 2019. But anyway, I don't want to get too much into that. But anyway, ultimately, Ralph Nader failed. Claude Anderson failed. The black billionaires and the super rich are not going to save us and not going to be participants in, in our empowerment or liberation or save the earth or the ecosystem. They're just not going to do it. But um, he also asserts um, another quote from the text. We need to somehow make it attractive for our pro bound athletes to become real heroes in the, um, in the perspective of their communities. So he wants to appeal to wealthy blacks, elite blacks, black athletes and prominent blacks to, to, to help us. And believe you me, if Kanye went to bed a MAGA head Uncle Tom and woke up a black revolutionary, I would not shun him. I would welcome him, his talent and resources. Same thing for LeBron James. If LeBron James said, I'm not opening these little vanity Nike schools, I want to truly fund revolutionary enlightenment and education for African people, I would embrace him, his resources and talent. But I just don't see it happening. Um, this is my favorite quote from the book. Overall, this is my favorite quote. If you don't remember anything else from my review of Who Stole the Soul, remember this. The purpose of entertainment is to temporarily distract us from reality, not replace it. That's my favorite quote of the book. Let me say it one more time. The purpose of entertainment is to temporarily distract us from reality, not replace it. And I'm going to just let that stand. That's my favorite book. Shout out to, to, to uh, Bernard for that one. But he also states, which I think he's coming back over to my side, race traders should never feel comfortable among us, regardless of their appeal to our emotions. Kanye. Too many. We got people that 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 screw us over on Wednesday and they at the cookout on Saturday. And I, I don't just go for artists. I mean, a congressman, a city council member, a school board person or your auntie or cousin. I think betraying the interest of black people while we're in the under a campaign of of of, of multi generational oppression and genocide needs to be called out. So, um, I want to jump to the chapter that's named after the book, "Who Stole the Soul," and this is where he really gets down. One of my favorite chapters. Um, Start off a quote from the chapter. Uh, the author states, the new owners of hip hop tend to be international investment firms that have no connection to hip hop beyond the companies they control. For them, the culture is just a commodity. Really good quote. Then he goes on in the section called the web of hip hop to talk about how degenerate hip hop 
feeds into much more than the music industry. So let's just follow this web that, that he weaves for us. You know, he states that Bain Capital, which is an investment uh, uh, venture capital company, owns iHeart Communication. iHeart Communication owns WGCI Chicago and Hot 97 NYC, which are two stations that play drill music and other degenerate, antisocial, reactionary, minstrel, gangster rap. Bain Capital also owns controlling a uh, stake in CCA, Correction Corps of America. Vanguard Group is the largest um, holder of CCA stock. Vanguard Group is the third largest holder of Viacom and Time Warner stock, which is one of the major gangster rap label distributors. Viacom, Viacom owns BET and MTV. Vanguard is the largest holder of the Geo Group, which is another, the second biggest private prison company. BlackRock is the world's largest asset manager. BlackRock Incorporated is the number one holder of Viacom and Time Warner stock. BlackRock is the second largest holder of CCA stock, Correction Corps of America, and it is the sixth largest holder of Geo Group. So that means the companies that tell you to be a gangster, tell you life is all about bitches and money, tell you to ride on your ops, smoking on your ops, the same company that promotes criminality, gangsterism, drug distribution, drug consumption, hyper-consumerism, wearing blood diamonds and gold chains and, and, and my bot, $100,000 cars that promote and drive in uh, people who have been systematically impoverished and denied opportunities for material wealth, the same company that promotes and, and drives criminality is the same company are the same companies that profit from people who fall for the okie doke, who end up in jail, mass incarceration. So it is a loop. And that's just one web. There are several other multinational corporations from Raytheon to, to, to GE. And you're not going to find, because every black billionaire has what you call a portfolio, a stock portfolio, assets. And in order to sustain, they don't just like me, you know, my wife and I, we get our meager income. We put it in our meager, you know, 1.2% interest gaining account. We don't have no portfolio. We don't have a bunch of assets. We don't have personal private team of accountants because we are not. I'm not a high value man and she's not a girl boss. We're two revolutionaries trying to liberate ourselves and our people. But those who got it like that, they own stock in these same companies. And the same way this author brilliantly breaks down Bain Capital and, and, and the BlackRock and the Vanguard Group and their ownership of the pro prison pipeline, the music to prison pipeline, the same, and didn't even get into the charter schools, school to prison pipeline. That could be done in almost any industry with any company. It's all connected. That's why he called it the web of hip hop. But going on to the final chapter, and thank you for riding out with me. I am so very pleased with this book. Shout out to uh, the author. Uh, got me a signed copy. He he signed my book. You know, he stays hip hop forever. So he still loves hip hop. He just wrote a book tearing down hip hop to the bone. But the brother still loves hip hop. And, and it's the same for me. I, I, I love hip hop. Uh, it's still uh, uh, an art form that I greatly appreciate and that helped to influence me in many positive ways. And that's why it's, we want to fight for hip hop. We're not trying to stop hip hop. We're trying to heal hip hop. But anyway, chapter 22, The Beautiful Struggle. The author states, or I quote the author, the only reason music glorifying negativity is outselling conscious hip hop is because the negative variety receives more exposure and financial backing from those who now own hip hop. That's it. That's that. That's the bottom line. 
you know, and there's many, and it ain't just old artists. You got contemporary artists. Shout out to Skip Coon. You know, shout out to Ad Two. I mean, I ain't heard of him since he signed to Kanye's album, but Ad Two and many other brilliant artists that 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 are out there. You know, keep the fight. You know, and keep your dignity and keep your soul. But anyway, these are some some suggestions from the author for for the larger struggle, the struggle to reclaim and and make hip hop African again, make hip hop great again, and for us as a people collective. Number one, media literacy, as I spoke to before. We got to be, we can't just be passive consumers of media. We have to be active and conscious leaders. We need to become archivists, you know, of, of, of our revolutionary media. You know, the Library of Congress, we can't depend on white European institutions to, to catalog and to stockpile, preserve our culture. So media literacy and, 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 and also becoming an amateur archivist is very important. Uh, learning about the media, the analysis, as he even talked about the the, the, the tones. And that doesn't mean you got to go and spend all your time. You can't enjoy the music. But to be honest, um, when my family and I, we hear a popular song or we sit and watch a movie together, part of our enjoyment is discussing the symbols, the hidden messages, the the politics or, or or cultural elements of it that could be part of enjoying you know enjoying the 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 fun of it and the entertainment aspect and also the scholarship element of it um organizing is important he says that you have to join an organization it's not enough just to be a, a voice in the wind um two organizations specific to to hip-hop is uh and and uh reclaiming hip-hop for african people and to stop the genocidal hip-hop from proliferating in our community is uh the clear the airways project uh overseen by brother kwabana and also the black leader uh the black national black leadership alliance you got to get organized you got to join uh, a progressive organization he also says that you can begin to contact the fcc about obscene content on black radio. And that's not censorship, that's regulation, which is a totally different thing. Um, you can still make all the, like pornography exists, but you don't turn it on and see it in primetime television. So why are you able to listen to death murder music? Not saying that you wanna ban all pornography or, or, or prevent someone from accessing that if they want it, but it shouldn't be made available to where our, our babies can just pick it up as they drive home after school or on their way to school, or on their way to lunch. So uh, contact the FCC and also local uh, regulatory agencies about and, and, and uh, these insidious, horrible genocidal music. And then uh, he talks about um, education, of course, press, culture, politics, and economics. In all these areas, we have to organize. And in the text, he gives specific steps and groups that we can take within the arena of organizing within education through formal education and educational institutions and 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 independent education uh through culture cultural events promoting revolutionary culture while dissecting and 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 purging the genocide and genocidal music and culture in politics and politics ain't democrat republican politics is all about um securing resources and distributing resources regulating how sec resources are are secured and what are the priorities for distributing and investing those resources that's what politics is and that's what you are electing officials to do and every elected official should have a stance on, on reparations if anything else i don't care about what your position well there's three things we should know what is your position on reparations before i vote for you what is your position on on uh, the the campaign of black genocide, which includes the murder music? And for me, what is your position on global warming and the and preservation of the ecosystem? So and economics. Um, again, he stresses ownership. I stress pulling resources and and cooperative economics. And I look forward to talking to him. And that's that. Twenty two chapters. You know, it's it's a good read. It's an accessible read. He's a scholar, but he makes the uh, he breaks down the the definition. He's got some really 
good images imagery in here well researched i give the book four black fists out of four black fists despite our disagreements um this is the bro diallo book review you can support um the book i'm not sure what the next book will be some people wanted me to do um imalamu baruti's um book um Imalamu Baruti's book, um, The Feminization of Black Boys. I might do that. This was the book I was going to do, uh, Locking Up Our Own. I was going to do Locking Up Our Own by James Foreman. But when I said that, a few people reached out to me and was like, brother, you said you're going to do this book. And so I did. I'm, I'm going to be responsive to my supporters and my listeners because I did say I was going to uh, review some a few other books. So I'm not going to just do the book I want to do. I want to be responsive to the people. But thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting the Bro Diallo broadcast. You can become a Patreon, Cash App Me, you know, a few bones um, if, if, if you're in a position to, or like, share, subscribe, and uh, be on the lookout. We're going to do at least a bi weekly or twice a month reviews if not more but there's so many books until i feel like i caught up i might do reviews more frequently but again thanks for listening and i look forward to hearing your feedback and be on the lookout for when we have the author of who stole the soul uh brother uh bernard creamer on our show and uh if you're looking at the screen you should now if it hasn't been up before see where you can purchase the book and any contact information that the author has available for us so that should be on the screen right now and with that i'll say good night and also there should i'm going to put up the uh list of organizations and the website for those organizations you know in the outro so it's not there now because i'm just recording the the video part but if you're looking at the screen you will also find that contact for the author, contact how to buy the book, and a contact of more of the organizations. And with that, I'll, I'll bid you adieu and uh, see you soon. Uh, shout out to, to Aromo uh, for, for editing. Shout out to, again, always co-conspirator number two, Chauncey. Um, big, big help, big uh, support. And uh, shout out to all my listeners, shout out to all revolutionary Pan-Africanists, and shout out to uh, the author, uh, Bernard Creamer.